Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Cook. Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Dr. Clive D.L. Wynn. He is an animal psychologist and the founding director of the Canine Science Laboratory at Arizona State University. He has published pieces in Psychology Today, New Scientist, and the New York Times, and has appeared on the National Geographic Explorer, PBS, and the BBC. He lives in Tempe, Arizona. Dr. Wynn, welcome to the program. Thank you, John. It's great to be with you all. The book Dog is Love was enough to get me interested because I do believe that's absolute truth. Uh, (laughs) I love dogs a a lot, and I've I've had great experiences with so many dogs. Um, You uh, started off as an animal psychologist and were working with various different kinds of animals like rats and pigeons, and and then you got to Australia to do marsupials. But but at some point, you realized that you needed to be studying dogs. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. I had a sort of a, it sounds like a cliche, but I had a a sort of a midlife crisis in my science. Mm -hmm. I came, when I moved to the United States, I couldn't continue working with marsupials, which have been really cool and fascinating. Uh, And I was looking for something new. And I realized that I'd always been fascinated by the minds of other species than our own, John. Mm -hmm. But I realized at some point that it wasn't just the animals themselves that fascinated me but the relationship between people and animals. Mm -hmm. And so I had a period of time in the early 2000s when I first came to the United States, when I was looking around, I was thinking, well, what what should I be studying? If these are my interests, what should I be studying? And I feel kind of foolish in retrospect, but it took me over a year to figure out that I needed to be studying dogs. Because if you're interested in the relationship between people and animals, there is no animal with which people have had a longer relationship or with which we now have a, a closer, more intimate relationship than with our dog. Mm-hmm. So, um, so it took me a while to come to where I needed to be. <laughs> yes. But I'm, I'm there now. And uh, w- when you un- undertook the study, a lot of the study of dogs had suggested uh, that because of their domestication, they had a very unique kind of intelligence. Um, but over time, you begin to realize that... Uh, and, and I'll quote you here, the dogs have an exaggerated, ebullient, perhaps even excessive capacity to form affectionate relationships with members of other species. That's right. That's exactly right, John. So, so psychology, you know, I mean, everybody does the name Pavlov ring a bell. You know, everybody <laughs> knows, <laughs> everybody, or almost everybody knows that animal psychology started with dogs over a century ago. But then for the longest time, dogs were just entirely forgotten. You know, nobody really wanted to study dogs it seems strange now but like through the whole middle of the 20th century right up to the end of the 20th century no scientists of any type were interested in dogs and then at the very end of the 20th century there was this revival of interest in dogs and this was some some really far-sighted people particularly brian hare who's now at duke university and a hungarian called adam Mikloshi at the university there in budapest and uh, these guys said, hey, you know, these animals are really interesting. <laughs> the fact that they are, that there are so many of them, that we get along with them so well, this is, this is actually surprising. And we should stop and we should take a look at this. And they, they did this and they did some fascinating studies. And both of them quite independently, Brian Hare and Adam McClosey, came to the conclusion that dogs had inherited, evolved a special kind of intelligence. The dogs had unique ways of understanding people that no other animal species shared. Um, So when I started studying dogs, that was the state of the field. And I I was not, I don't think I was unduly skeptical about this. It seemed like a a, a plausible, a reasonable sort of approach to take. But then as my students and I, and certainly when you study dogs, don't get me wrong, dogs are amazingly sensitive to the things people are up to. Uh, There's no, no question about that. But as my students and I started studying dogs and comparing them to their wild ancestors, wolves, uh, and other species too, we began to find that actually, yes, okay, dogs are very sensitive to what people are up to. But in fact, any animal that lives that closely, that intimately alongside human beings will develop that kind of sensitivity. It's not something about being a dog. It's something about growing up in human households. 
And so I came to a kind of a, a kind of a crisis, which I describe in my book, Dog is Love, where I'm like, yeah, it doesn't seem that this is the right way to understand dogs, but I don't know what the right way is. And it was around that time that my family decided to take on a dog. We hadn't actually had a dog for a variety of reasons for a few years, but we decided it was time we got a new dog. And so we got this dog. It's right here next to me now as I'm talking to you. Mm-hmm. Let's say her name, her ears will twitch. So we got Zephos. Uh-huh. Yeah, twitch, yep. Yeah. Um, we got Zephos seven years ago. And she started explaining it to me, really, honestly, Don. She started explaining to me what it was that's special about her kind. And what's special is not some special, unique form of intelligence, but this amazing capacity, desire to form strong emotional bonds, which in my scientific writing I call, you know, we have to use, we have to come up with long words, right? We have to come up with long words. We've got hypersociability. We've got... Um, uh, exaggerated gregariousness. You know, these are the kinds of words you can put in a scientific report. Mm. But when it comes down to it, we're just talking about love. Yeah. What makes dogs so successful is their amazing capacity to form loving connections with members of other species. That's their that's their secret superpower. Yeah, and and I'm glad you were willing to use the L word as well as the scientific words there. Um, this uh, uh, there's a couple of things you touched on that I want to. Uh, resurrect a thought about a thought or two about one is pavlov does the name pavlov ring a bell i was so disappointed to find out that it wasn't a bell at all but a buzzer oh that's right i mean so it turns out that for the longest time i mean pavlov died in i think 35 36 and for the longest time we actually knew almost nothing about him but then a couple of years ago a historian at johns hopkins university in baltimore who's married to a russian woman published the most fantastic book i mean pavlov's life my goodness i mean the science, the dogs, the Russian Revolution, mm-hmm. Stalin's purges. I mean, wow. Wow. What a, what a life. Amazing. Mm-hmm. And, and his famous experiment, conditioning dogs to salivate and then uh, respond to the buzzer, uh, although I always thought it was a bell, the buzzer uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, to salivate w- w- because it was associated with the food is, is classic in, in how we train, well, dogs and people both. Absolutely, John. I mean, it's, it's, it's an absolute cornerstone building block, fundamental process that uh, affects the behavior of every animal that it's, anybody's ever tried to find it in. You know, they've, nobody's ever found an animal that didn't get conditioned in this way. It's, a, it's an absolutely crucial ability to get through life. But, you know, it sounds so weird when you hear about his experiment and so on, but fundamentally, it's just an ability to detect signals in the world around you. Anything that predicts that something that matters to you is going to happen. Uh, that's what Pavlovian conditioning is all about. Mm-hmm. And um, But what I find interesting, John, of reading this biography of Pavlov, so of course, you know, anybody who's taken basic psychology has heard about Pavlov. I mean, it's everywhere in our culture. But what you don't hear about is that Pavlov gave every single one of his dogs a name, that part of the success of his science was that his dogs were, for the time, relatively well cared for where other scientists who were the dogs were more commonly used in science than those days other scientists dogs would tend to die because they weren't well taken care of pavlov could keep his dogs alive indefinitely he gave them names and he recognized that they had distinct personalities and so there are records that have survived all this time you know the name of the dog and a little bit about the dog's personality you know calm relaxed or flighty and uptight you know Mm -hmm. it's really quite interesting uh, while we're on dog-loving scientists, let's talk about Darwin a little bit. Uh, I, I, I remember that his ship was the HMS Beagle, but I had no idea what a strong connection with dogs he had all his life. So, so of course, the, the name of the ship is just a coincidence, but it's an attractive coincidence because that voyage around the world, which took him three or four years, was actually the only period of Darwin's life when he was not accompanied by a dog. Darwin was dog crazy, and when he was a teenager... His uh, father wrote him a letter saying how disappointed in him he was. <laughs> and one of the things that his father mentioned was that the, you know, the only thing he seemed to be interested in was his dog. And, um, and uh, all the way through his life, Darwin uh, thought about dogs. He thought about dogs in his most famous book, The Origin of Species. He thinks about dogs and he thinks about dog breeding quite a bit in there. It helps him and I think 
helps his, helped his readers to understand his theory of natural selection, to talk about how people were carrying out selection on animals and could change their shapes. And, and he talks about dogs. And there are even things like in his private notebooks when he, he's not sure whether he should get married or not. And he draws up, he, he puts a line down the middle of a piece of paper and at the top it says to marry or not to marry. And on the left, he puts the reasons in favor. And on the right, he puts the reasons against mm-hmm. getting married. And somewhere in the reasons in favor of getting married is that he notes that this would be an individual who would love you uh, more, more than a dog. I think he puts something like that. So he, compares, he compares the potential love that he might receive from his wife to mm-hmm. the love that he receives from his dog. <laughs> and then what I think is sweetest is at the very end of his life, uh, and, and, and this comes from his wife's diaries. So I think Darwin died on a Tuesday. Let's say it was a Tuesday. And his dog died on the Thursday. You know, they, they, the dog didn't survive more than a couple of days after the old man's death. Wow. And uh, was the dog, the, Darwin's wife, Emma, records the dog was buried under the apple tree. And uh, you can probably hear it in my accent. I'm from Britain originally. <laughs> and my mother lives fairly close to Darwin's house. And so the last time I was there, I visited Darwin's house and I marched up to some dozen. I said, so where's the apple tree that Darwin's dog's buried underneath? But um, (laughs) she thought I was pretty crazy. And it was rather stupid of me because, of course, no apple tree could possibly survive such a such a long time. So Mm -hmm. there are apple trees there, but they couldn't be the same exact same trees as were there back in the late 19th century. Uh-huh. So yeah, Darwin and Dogs, it's a, there's, a, there's a book about it by um, Townsend. A beautiful little book came out a few years ago. It's a fascinating story. Since we mentioned natural selection, and uh, t- I, I tie that into the artificial selection, let's talk about how dogs became domesticated, because there's some interesting stuff there, and dispelling the old myth that it was just uh, wolves that turned into helpful hunters uh, early on, and it's really not quite like that, is it? No, absolutely, John. So, so Darwin believed, and a lot of people still believe, that human beings invented dogs, that we found the friendliest wolves, and those wolves would help us hunt. And over time, we would select in each generation the friendliest wolves to be the parents of the next generation. And so bit by bit, we built ourselves dogs. And it could have worked like that in some sense, because in Russia, of all places, in Soviet Russia, in Siberia, and I've, I've visited there, and I tell the story in the book, they did this with foxes. They created these super-friendly foxes by selecting in each generation the friendliest foxes that they had to be the parents of the next generation. And it actually went much faster than I would have expected. Within a couple of generations, they could tell that something was happening. And within 20 generations, they had succeeded. They had created a completely new, super-friendly fox, the likes of which the planet had never seen before. So you can you can do this by humans stepping in, but I think it's I think it's wrong to imagine that that's what our ancestors could or would have done 15 to 20,000 years ago for a whole bunch of reasons and I t- I talk about them in the book Doggy's Love. So one thing is that wolves don't help people hunt. Wolves don't help people hunt. I mean, wolves are 100% successful hunters on their own. If you were to go hunting with your pet wolf, so suppose somehow that you, this person of 15 to 20,000 years ago, where there are no collars, no leashes, no fences, no gates, nonetheless, you somehow got a wolf around your, your village, your camp, and uh, you can tolerate the fact that it's been eating some of your children, but never mind that. <laughs> and you, you somehow get it to go to the forest with you to go on a hunt. Well, you get to the forest... And the wolf runs away hunting. And a couple of days later, the wolf comes back and the wolf is, has a really full stomach. And you, you are still hungry because (laughs) the wolf has no need for you. You do nothing useful for the wolf. Mm -hmm. So I talk, I talk about this in a visit I made to Israel where I stumbled across some filmmakers who wanted to make a film about domestication and had hand reared some wolves. And, um, and they made a little movie where they pretended to show how a guy had gone hunting with a pet wolf. But when I got to talking to them about the making of this movie, it turned out that it hadn't, it really hadn't worked. And that the wolves, once they had a, they had, the people had killed a deer 
and they put that down in front of the wolves so that they could film the wolves and the man coming home with the with the deer carcass. It hadn't worked at all. The wolves had attacked the actor, and filming had to be stopped while his wounds were treated because it was such a disaster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so about um, the, the scars yeah. he showed you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, meanwhile, I also describe in the book a trip I made to Nicaragua where I went hunting with some native people who hunt in something like the way that our ancestors could have done, and they hunt with dogs. And the beauty of the dogs is, you know, this is, this is Nicaragua. This is a tropical rainforest. It's very difficult to see anything for, in a tropical rainforest. It's very difficult to move for a human being, very difficult to move through a tropical rainforest. Whereas the dogs are relying on smell, not vision. So they can, they can perceive things in the forest that people cannot perceive. And they're so small, they can easily run through the forest. And so the, the dogs, they perceive the prey, they run after the prey, they catch up with the prey, but they cannot take it that final step. They are not strong enough to kill the prey themselves. And so they call out so that the people will catch up. And the people catch up, and the people kill the prey, and the people and the dogs share the success of the hunt. That's a partnership, but it only works precisely because the dog is incapable of finishing this job on his own. So he needs the humans and he calls for the humans. So dogs must, to go hunting with a dog, you first have to have a dog. You cannot go hunting with a wolf. Mm -hmm. So that idea that dogs arose by people selecting the friendliest wolves to be the parents of the next generation Aside from the fact that our ancestors all those years ago had no, no idea that breeding could come to any useful outcome, had no way of controlling who wolves would mate with. You, you know, a, a male wolf wants to mate with a female wolf. You're going to get in, into a fight with them and tell, tell him, no, this is not the right female? <laughs> I mean, come on. It couldn't have been done that way. Mm-hmm. An interesting point about the dogs in the, in the forest, because uh, as the ice age was ending, there was still plenty of tundra and there weren't a lot of trees. But as as the earth changed and became more forested, the eyesight of the humans wasn't very helpful because the, they couldn't see what was hidden in the forest. And that's when the super sensitive smell of dogs became helpful to hunt. Exactly, John. I've always thought I always thought the Ice Age sounds like a bad situation and the end of the Ice Age sounds like a good situation from my, from my limited perspective. But actually for our ancestors, the end of the Ice Age created a whole bunch of new challenges. And one was that cold environments tend to be open, right? The open tundra. Or you think of pine forests in cold parts of the world. They have very little undergrowth. Our ancestors were really good at hunting in cold environments because, as you say, vision is all-powerful in those open environments. But as the, as the world warms up and the forests fill in, then our ancestors are stuck in a really difficult situation. And without dogs, you know, who knows how we would have made it through that period of our history. Dogs were an absolutely crucial, we could say, technology for our ancestors. And I think, I think, I mean, we don't know. We don't know. We're guessing. But my guess is that that's where the affectionate bonds between people and dogs first came to the forefront. That's that's my guess, my feeling about it. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, you mentioned that Israeli movie, and I know that I've seen a movie where a primitive young boy befriends a wolf because they help each other when they're injured. I, the name of the movie escapes me right now. But but the real scenario is more likely uh, that there were dogs who weren't that good at hunting, or wolves that weren't that good at hunting, who counted on the garbage heaps to find their food. Absolutely, John. So, so the most plausible theory for the earliest part of the history of the dog is that our ancestors became settled from time to time, place to place, sometimes years, sometimes generations. You could find a place where there's plenty of food, good hunting. Often fishing comes into it because uh, whereas when people settle, when hunter-gatherers settle down in one location uh, on land, they tend to exhaust that location and they're forced to move on to a new location. But when hunter-gatherers are fishing, when they buy water, water self-replenishes. You know, the new fish come down the river and the ocean has plenty. You don't tend to use that up. So anyway, so our ancestors, 15 to 20,000 years ago, from time to time, they settled down. And one of the characteristics of our species, John, 
when we settle in one place for any period of time is that we create mounds of trash. There's always elements of what we're eating that we cannot ourselves eat and that we throw on the edge of our village. And we create a heap, and that heap of trash is useless to us, but other species can still extract things of value from it. Here in the United States, in other first world countries, we pay taxes to pay our cities to keep those trash heaps clean, right? We have fences, we have animal catchers. We don't see a lot of wildlife on our trash heaps. But in other parts of the world, uh, animals on the trash heaps are a very standard part of life throughout the third world. Even, even, um, even in Alaska, I'm told, you get bears coming in to help themselves to what they can find on the, on the city dumps. Mm-hmm. So that's the first starting point, and that attracts animals. And in that community of animals that are attracted to human trash are wolves. And we see this. We see this in Alaska. We see this in Scandinavia. Wolves are attracted. Well, you see it in Israel, actually. There are wolves in Israel, smaller subspecies, but there are wolves in Israel. And they're attracted to city trash dumps. And over time, we know that different, different families, different communities of wolves specialize on different types of prey. And so there are, there are elk specialists and there are deer specialists and so on. And wolves that specialize on different types of prey tend to breed together. Because, and you can think of this, you know, if I'm, if I'm a he-wolf and I'm raised by an elk hunting family, then when it's time for me to get married and find a she-wolf to raise our own uh, puppies, then I should probably try and find a she-wolf who's been taught how to hunt elk as well. Because if I go, if I do a Romeo and Juliet thing and I find myself a she-wolf who's an expert in hunting deer, then we're going to have we're going to have domestic strife. You know, are we hunting elk or are we hunting deer? And the techniques I know and the techniques she knows, you know, they might not be compatible. So wolves that hunt the same prey species tend to mate together. And so presumably if there are wolves who've made it their life's work to specialize on human trash, then they're also likely to mate together. Mm -hmm. And since hunting hunting trash, we don't hunt trash, do we? Since scavenging on trash is a quite different task from hunting live prey, then we would expect evolutionary selection to kick in. And I think that that's the process, natural selection, evolution, selecting in each generation those wolves that are best able to scavenge human trash, that would gradually lead over many generations to the natural creation of the animal we call the dog. Mm -hmm. And you had some interesting visits to places that uh, raise raise and study wolves, uh, and they they are at best semi-tamed by this process, it seems. To well, me. John, so, so um, yeah, so my students and I have done a lot of work at Wolf Park in Indiana who have been hand-rearing wolves since 1974. So they're really good at it. They pioneered the techniques to hand-rear wolves. And the first thing is that whereas I like to say any idiot can tame a dog, I mean, it's so easy to hand-rear a dog that we hardly ever talk about it, right? I mean, it's... It, doesn't take any conscious effort really to raise a dog. If the dogs are around, if puppies are around people, they're tame, right? Mm-hmm. Now, that's not, that's not inevitable. In the 1950s, when ethical standards were different, people did experiments where they intentionally raised dog pups without any human contact for the first three and a half months of life. And those scientists reported that those dogs, once they were adults, were little wild animals. And there was nothing they could then do to tame them. Dogs do have to be tamed. It's just so easy that we don't notice ourselves doing it. Mm -hmm. Whereas wolves and other wild animals, the window of opportunity, that window of early life where you have the opportunity to convince an animal it's okay to be friends with humans, is very, very much shorter. It's probably only about three weeks rather than three and a half months. And during that window of opportunity, you really have to give the puppies maximum exposure to human beings if they are going to become tame. So out of Wolf Park, they're with the wolf pups 24-7 for the first so many weeks of life. When they've done that, they do end up with animals which are tame and are certainly affectionate towards the people that raised them. And many of them, perhaps most of them, are also calm and gentle around people that they do not know personally. They never have 
the same level of interest, friendly interest in as many people as dogs so easily develop. And the other thing is, and whenever I bring this up, I always mention, it's a really bad idea hand-raising wild animals, or a bad idea for an amateur, I mean, for a layperson to try and do, because even if that wolf accepts you as a social partner, some of the things wolves do to their social partners are very dangerous for people. Mm -hmm. So I like to say even a love bite from a wolf would really ruin your day, right? Uh -huh. I mean, they have a way of interacting with each other that with their big jaws and so on, and their much thicker hides than our puny thin skin, um, they have a way of interacting which just isn't safe for us. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, wild animals can be tamed. I mean, lion tamer, that's a real thing. Uh, but it's but it's very challenging, uh, whereas uh, our dogs and other domesticated animals, cats obviously and so on, uh, are very very much easier to tame. So so uh, yeah, so it's all part of their their evolutionary makeup. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned some study that's done with DNA that indicates uh, the capacity for affection and love that dogs have that can be identified genetically. And uh, if they don't bond with humans, they may bond with other species because they just have a need to bond. Well, right, John. So this is, uh, in, to, my, to my mind, when people ask me what's the most exciting science in my book, Dog is Love, then this is, to my mind, the single most exciting thing I have in there, which is a study I was involved in myself, where we looked at the behavioral differences in how loving, friendly dogs and wolves are. And we collaborated with a geneticist and we were able to identify three genes that mutated in the journey from wolf to dog. And those three genes are responsible for the heightened friendliness, loviness of dogs. In human beings, if you have mutations in those genes, you suffer from an extremely rare syndrome called Williams syndrome, of which one of the major symptoms is that people with Williams syndrome have a greatly exaggerated capacity and desire to form strong, loving relationships. So we have a direct connection there. We can actually see the genes for love shining through. So, and now I've forgotten what the second part of your question was, John. Um, that capacity for affection might turn itself to another animal rather than a human. Oh, right, right, right. So I, it's important to realize, I think, that dogs love us, but it's not about us. It's about them. Dogs have an amazing capacity to form strong, loving bonds with members of other species. In our lives, that's usually us, but it doesn't have to be us. And dogs, dogs who work as livestock guardians, for example, the rancher will put the puppies with the animals that he wants them to guard. So I visited um, goat ranchers here in Arizona, and they put the puppies with goats and the goats grow up developing the same kind of affectionate bonds. The dogs grow up forming the same kind of affectionate bonds towards goats that we so commonly see them form towards us. That's not exclusive. I mean, these dogs like people as well as goats. I mean, the, the dogs have great capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and in the book, I talk about the most colorful example of dogs who protect penguins off the south coast of Australia. And those dogs are put with penguins when they're puppies, and so they grow up forming strong affectionate bonds towards the penguins. Mm -hmm. We only have about three minutes left. I did want to note something that really surprised me. Uh, of the billion or so dogs that exist on the planet, only about 300 million live as pets inside people's homes. There's an awful lot of street dogs, and you mentioned 35,000 in Moscow and all over India. There are street dogs that survive quite well uh, by being sensitive to which humans they can approach for food and whatever else they need. That's right, John. So these numbers are just guesses, right? Nobody's been out and counted every dog in the world. Right. There's like something up to about a billion dogs. And it's also not much more than a guess as to how many of them are pets. But certainly the majority of dogs on the world today are not pets. They live near people. They interact with people, but they do that on the streets and in the fields. Uh, and Unfortunately, those free-living dogs are relatively little studied because they tend to be in poorer countries with fewer scientists in them. But there are now a few good groups studying those dogs, including one that I talk about in the book in India. And they did an amazing thing, right? They just walked up to some of these dogs. And some of them they gave a little piece of food to. And some of them they patted gently on the head three times. 
And they did this for a week. And then at the end of the week, they offered the dogs some food to see which dogs were more interested in people. And it turned out it was the dogs who'd been patted who were more interested in people than the dogs who'd been fed. So the, the dogs are uh, dogs that live out on the street. They're connecting with people just as dogs who live as pets do. And in many ways, the task they have is even more challenging than the case for most pet dogs because not everybody likes these dogs. I mean, tens of thousands of people die of rabies in India every year. So Indians are rightly wary of the dogs out on their streets. And there are plenty of cases where people kill these dogs and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So the dogs have to be very wary. And yet they're still open to forming affectionate connections with people. I think that's amazing. Yeah. I only have a minute left, but I did want to touch on uh, a topic near and dear to my heart and five devotees of animal rescue that I'm well familiar with. Dogs deserve better. Uh, what could you say in one minute about this chapter on, on the kennels? And uh, Yeah, abso and absolutely, John. So I end the book with this chapter, Dogs Deserve Better. Because, uh, because they do, because they've, they've given up so much to be our companions, and that's so good for us, we owe something to them. And so to just draw out one headline point, I think the cruelest thing that we routinely accept is leaving dogs alone. Dogs are highly social beings. That's why we love them, for their, for their affection for us. And yet it's, it's broadly acceptable in our culture to leave your dog home alone in solitary confinement for 8, 10, 12 hours a day while you go out to work. And I, I really wish people wouldn't do that. I know, you know, I'm very privileged. I have a very flexible work schedule. I'm here at home right now. My dog's on the floor next to me. Not everybody can do that. But it's something to think about if you're considering getting a dog. And uh, if you have a dog and you have to be out for so many hours a day, as so many people do, then think about how to give your dog affectionate company. That could be a dog walker, a dog sitter, a neighbor, a friend, a doggy daycare. Uh, it, it's, it's really important, I think, to reciprocate the affection that these animals feel for us and to give them the social support that they, that they deserve and need. And I, I endorse that. I had some loving do dog walkers who took care of my dog during the day when I was far away uh, at work. Uh, That's right. This is a wonderful piece of work. The, the title is Dog is Love, Why and How Your Dog Loves You. We've been talking about Dr. Clive Wynn. Uh, if you love dogs at all, you need to pick up this book. Uh, I'm John Cook, your host. I remind you, if you don't catch our regularly scheduled broadcast, you can also pick us up on YouTube at Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. Thanks for listening, and make it a great day.